home ownership just came to a screeching halt. Oh, it's over. Okay. That's how informal it is. Because it's informal and it only involves letters, the lender doesn't have to hire lawyers. That's never a good thing. The lender doesn't have to hire lawyers. So therefore, it's cheaper, less expensive to do a non-judicial foreclosure. Also, it's a place to not the court system, so it's much quicker. So a non-judicial foreclosure is quick and cheap. A judicial foreclosure, on the other hand, takes place in the court system. They do have to hire lawyers, and since it's in the court system, it's slow. So a judicial foreclosure is slow and expensive. So if you were the lender, which foreclosure would you use to take back a property? Non-judicial. Cheap and quick. Right? So, and, and it's true. The vast majority of foreclosures are non-judicial. The judicial foreclosures do occur. We have them in our office right now. But they're rare. Statistically speaking, the vast majority are non-judicial. If you're facing a foreclosure, the odds are you're going to be facing a non-judicial foreclosure. No guarantee of that, but you probably will. Okay, so the out-of-court foreclosure, remember? I said it begins with the notice of default. The notice of default, you'll know when you get it. You'll know when you get it because you're going to get a lot of them. You get one certified mail with a green card attached to it. Then another one, duplicate copy, comes regular mail. Third copy is reported to the county reporter's office. And that's as to each person on the loan. That's as to each person on the loan. And it'll say on there, notice of default. It's going to say, hey, buddy, you didn't pay. That's essentially what it says. Okay, that's what the notice of default says. Now, it's lender initiated. When does the lender initiate it? When they want. It's discretionary with the lender when they initiate it. Assuming that there's the, the borrower is a breach of contract. Discretion with the lender. There's no law out there that says, okay, three days after the borrower fails to make the June payment, they've got to, you know, draft up and send out a notice of default. They want to wait three months after the last payment to send it? They can't. They want to wait a year? They can't. They want to wait one month? They can't. It's discretionary with the lender. Now, but once the lender initiates it, he's got to allow a minimum of three months to elapse. A minimum of three months to elapse. He can let more months elapse. He just can't let any fewer than three months elapse before sending out that second that second notice. Does that make sense? It's, to a certain degree, it's discretionary with the lender as to how much time he's going to let elapse between those two notices. Okay? Then you get that second notice, the notice of sale. In the notice of sale, it will say in there, on this date, at this time, at this location, your property is going to be sold. Now, 20 days, 20 days, there must be a minimum of 20 days between the date of the notice of sale and the sale date of the property. There can be more than 20 days, there just can't be any fewer than 20 days. And here again, in part, it's discretionary with the lender as to how much, how many days there are going to be between the date of the notice and the date of the sale. Now, can you see a little bit how homeowners are treated differently? You hear stories. I, I've seen it myself. I've had clients myself that have been in a property. They haven't made a payment in two years. And they're still living large in that property. And you have other people, five months are out. See, that's not fair. What did our parents say about life not being fair? That's not fair. Why the difference? Why? Basically, it comes down to how the lenders are exercising their discretion. They have the, they have discretion. 
They have discretion in the matter. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to those two types of foreclosure. I'm going to talk to you real quick about the origins of California's foreclosure laws. Because I want you to understand the importance of what I said at the beginning. That the creditor-debtor relationship is very adversarial. Horribly adversarial. It has always been that way. Back during the great California's anti-deficiency statutes, those laws I gave you at the very beginning, and I'll reintroduce them here in a little bit, they originated during the Great Depression. Imagine a scenario. This is a real life scenario that have actually happened. Imagine a scenario where you have a house and you have a loan on it, Bank of America, for 500 grand. One loan, it goes into foreclosure. It sells at the foreclosure sale. Now, mind you, at a foreclosure sale, if the property is being sold as is, where it is, without any representations or warranties of any kind. Whereas if you go through a conventional sale, as any of the fine realtors in this room will tell you, there are representations of warranties. There's title insurance. You don't have that with, 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 with your buyer property at a foreclosure sale. You're taking the risk of any problems with the physical problem with the property, and you're assuming the risk of any problems with the title to the property. Consequently, people aren't willing to spend as much money at a foreclosure sale as they would if they were buying property conventionally. So most of the time, the properties don't sell for anywhere near market value at a foreclosure sale. Because the buyer is buying it as is, where it is, without representations or warranties. So coming back to the example that I'm giving you, imagine you have a loan for $500,000 with Bank of America. Bank of America, as do most lenders, they frequently buy the properties themselves at the foreclosure sale. They get to do what's called a credit bid, meaning they don't have to write a check. They don't have to come out of pocket any money. They just bid a dollar amount, and so long as that dollar amount is less than the loan balance, it's just a straight offset against the loan balance. They don't have to come out of pocket any money. It's called a credit bid. So Bank of America, at its own foreclosure sale, at your foreclosure sale, where the loan is $500,000, bids $10,000. Going once, going twice, sold for $10,000. Now, what does Bank of America do? Bank of America is now the owner of the property. What do they do with the property? They give it to a real estate office. Some realtors get in there, they purdy it up, they shampoo the carpet, they paint the walls, they landscape it, they make it purdy. They put it on the market and they sell it. They sold it for five hundred thousand dollars. The bank is thinking, oh great, five hundred thousand dollars. They put it in their pocket. They thank you very much. Then they send you a nice little letter, and they say, "Hello, we're calling to make payment arrangements for the four hundred ninety thousand dollars you still owe on your loan." And you say, well, "Wait a minute, no way, Jose! You just got five hundred thousand dollars on the sale of my house. Why should I have to pay you anything?" The bank says, oh, no, 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 we, we have a misunderstanding. See, your house sold for $10,000. My house sold for $500,000. Write me a check. And it used to be, in California, the banks would win on that. Until the legislature got wind of it. They said, wait a minute, the banks, you guys, are, you guys are bad guys. You can't do that. Thank you. Jig is up. They, they found us out. Well, did they really? So the legislature, back during the Great Depression, they passed a law. They said, banks, 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 when you're, when you're calculating deficiency liability, you can't use the dollar amount that the property actually sold for at the foreclosure sale. No, no, that, 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 you, that results in a windfall to you guys. You have, to, you have to use fair market value. You have to use fair market value. And the banks moaned and groaned about it, but they eventually, you know, they gave in on the point. What could they do? It was the legislature passing the law. So, the legislature said you have to provide